Hi everyone, it's Michael here, and I'm trying an experiment for the first time today. I've been thinking about how to sharpen my programming skills. So I spend a lot of time programming, but I don't spend a lot of time doing deliberate practice to improve those skills. And I recently read uh, Badass by Kathy Sierra, which talked a lot about deliberate practice. And I've been reading Dan Liu's blog, and he talks about how he improved his efficiency and velocity with programming. And I was trying to think about how I could do that myself. And I was talking to my friend, David Toth. And one idea we came up with was recording myself and then reviewing the footage and then looking for areas where I can improve. So that's what I did. I spent some time refactoring a part of my open source project, What Got Done. It's a, a weekly status update tool. And I've been reading Matt Ryer's book, Go Blueprints, and uh, I saw a pattern in it that I liked and I thought it would be useful to have in What Got Done. And so I recorded myself applying that pattern. So I've got the recording. So let's start here. So you see here, I'm starting with a uh, BERT proxy. So it's a HTTP proxy that shows you all of the requests and responses. Um, it's not a very popular tool with web developers, but I, I really like it. And so I'm getting started here. I'm This is the readme for what got done. And to start a development server, um, I'm going through the instructions in the readme and copy pasting them into the terminal. So I've got to start. I use Google Cloud Firestore. So I'm using a Firestore emulator, adding some dev data. Then I'm building the front end, building back end. And then I've got to start a hot road reloading uh, front end server. And so right off the bat, you see this is a really slow process. We're 45 seconds in, and I am not even at the point where like I actually have a server running. And it's it's really tedious to just keep jumping back and forth from the readme and back to the terminal to type these commands in. So there, there's an ob obvious bottleneck right there. Um, and I'm going to talk later about how I fix that. Um, so now I've got the the backend running. I'm using a tool called mod. Here's another mistake I made. Um, the instructions say to use gopath slash bin slash mod. Uh, I didn't have gopath set in this virtual machine. Um, I It's one of those things like I know gopath is deprecated, and I, I don't know if it's a thing that the installer is supposed to add or if I'm supposed to add. And so that was a thing I had to research. Um, but that was a bottleneck here. Um, you're seeing this is this is also just kind of a silly mistake. This is not a huge pattern mistake, but I realized that uh, the burp proxy was intercepting all requests and blocking them. But now you can see I've got what got done running. Um, so the server is running, the front end and the back end are running. So I'm ready to start making my changes. And so the thing I'm doing here is the pattern that I liked from Matt Ryer is he, in, in Go Blueprints, he says that you want to abstract away the um, the format that the, the front end and back end are talking to each other. And I like that idea. And so instead of in in what got done, the way I've done it is all the handlers um, at the end of the HTTP handler, they respond by encoding the data in JSON. Um, but in Matt Ryer's example, you can just uh, create like a wrapper function that, uh, that abstracts away the encoding. So if you want to, in the future, um, do like a binary encoding or protobuf. Um, you can just change the the wrapper code, and you don't have to change all your handlers. Um, so this is a stupid thing I did. Um, I started writing out the imports manually, and I really don't need to do that. I'm using VS Code, and I'm using the the Go tools for VS Code, so it will just automatically put in the imports automatically. Um, there there are some cases where it's ambiguous and it can't get it, but I think in this case that that's some wasted time of me. Um, manually adding those imports. And so you, you also see a pause here as I'm reading the the example from Matt Ryer. He published the examples from his book on GitHub. Um, there's a bit of a pause there. I, I don't think that's too bad of a pause because you at the end of the day, you do need some time to uh, read the code and understand it. And then I, I didn't notice um, until I actually pasted it in, but Matt Ryer has this kind of like odd um, formatting. I guess it's he he did it really tight to fit in the book, but I'm not sure why, because right there that's going more columns, but I'm I'm going through and kind of reformatting it to um, match the, the column width that I like. I'm changing the what Matt Ryer did a little bit. Um, Matt Ryer just has a method called respond. I changed it to respond okay. So it's a specific wrapper for when 
the, the HTTP response is a, a successful response, a 200 OK. So I'm messing around with this a little bit. Um, I'm getting a little bit confused myself um, because I, I'm kind of failing to recognize like where I should, um, that, I, that this is just a copy of this and I just have to uh, wrap the call to respond OK and put in the status. Um, I'll pause here, actually. Um, this maybe wasn't a great idea um, because there, there are no callers to respond or encode body. So maybe this should have just all been inlined into respond OK. Um, yeah, I'm, I did it with the expectation that I'm going to eventually kind of follow in Matt Ryer's footsteps and have like a respond error um, and those other functions where I'd want them decomposed. But I, I could have uh, put them all together and just inlined it. But that's, that's not a huge bottleneck. So here I'm actually using this. This is the first place where I'm gonna um, where I'm gonna call that respond OK function. And so I'm looking for places where I actually encode data in in JSON. And I'm having trouble actually finding a place where I do that. And then finally, I, I remember that draft.go has definitely encodes the response in JSON. And so here's me trying to call this new function that I added, and I, I spend an embarrassing amount of time just trying to call the function. And I get confused because I, I like Go's, um, I, I've adopted Go's standard of using terse variable names. So like W is for HTTP response writer, R is for uh, the, what is it, HTTP request. Um, but you see, I'm like respond OK takes a re request writer, a HTTP request, and then the data, but I've got this out of order. I'm, I've got the uh, resp struct. And then the other thing I'm realizing is that um, this is actually like kind of an inefficient way to do this. Um, that uh, I'll pause here. So I'm, I'm declaring a new type of struct called response and then uh, creating a response type struct, but I don't actually need to do this. I only use this struct once. So this can be an anonymous struct. I don't actually have to name it and I can just uh, create the, the struct inline. And so I'm doing that, but I'm, I keep running into the formatter, the, my VS code formatter is yelling at me that I'm not doing it correctly. And so I, I had to quickly Google, like, what is the, the syntax for anonymous structs? And I think I've got it at this point. Do I, I, yeah, this is like a, a few layers of confuse because I realized, okay, I have to replace the data, get rid of that. Um, but I've still got an error here. This is messing up the syntax of the uh, anonymous struct, and I'm missing it. And then I've also got a, a mistake here where it's still referencing this old variable, and I, it takes me a while to, to recognize that. So let's just speed this up. And I fumble around with this. Okay, this I finally do get the anonymous struct syntax right. Do I get it here? No, I'm still, I'm still getting confused. So this is a, another bottleneck, and this is sort of like a... I guess this is like kind of Go rustiness because I haven't written Go in a few weeks and I'm forgetting the, the syntax for struct, uh, for anonymous structs. And I think here I'm I'm getting closer. I should realize, okay, uh, no, I missed it. <laughs> should, okay, there, there we go. I finally get it right. And yeah, okay, so now I've got the syntax right. Um, I'm not declaring the, the struct inline. It really should be within this respond okay function, but I just wanted to, to kind of simplify and make sure try not to do too many things at once. And so um, at this point, I'm ready to run go test. And here is another uh, blunder where, um, so I, I see the test failing, but I expected it to pass. And the thing I actually forgot is that I didn't remove the redundant encoder here. So um, my tests are gonna fail because it's getting two different JSON responses. Like both of these things expect to end the response. Um, and so my tests are failing. But I'm confused by that because I, um, oh, and then here's another mistake. Uh, I forgot that I was like in the middle of another branch. So you see there's, um, I've got package lock in the middle of being opened. So I have to get rid of that change and then switch to a fresh branch. So that's that's a thing I should remember to do. Um, so here's me, uh, GCBM is a git alias I have, git checkout branch master. So it syncs the latest master and then checks out a new branch. Okay, so now I'm in a clean branch. Run go test again. And I'm I'm continuing to be confused because I'm like, the syntax is right. Why is this test failing? And 
part of the thing that's confusing me is that you see like user.go and I'm not understanding why I'm seeing failures for files I didn't actually touch. And I think slowly I realized this is just log output from the normal execution of the, the program. So like what got done logs errors when it sees um, invalid, in, incorrectly formatted requests, but it's cluttering up the, the output when a test fails. So go test normally doesn't show log output, but when a test fails, it does. But there's there's so much log output that I'm missing where the, the actual error is. And so I scroll a little bit, um, scrolling, scrolling, and let's see, do we, I think I give up here. Um, yeah, because I'm so confused about like what's going on, I'm, I'm still suspicious that something else um, is going wrong. So I'm just trying to check out master and make sure if I have no, if I have no changes or test passing, I verify it, it is. So I'm like, okay, it must be something I'm doing. So we come back to uh, JSON response is the branch I was working in. I do git undo or gu, which is uh, uh, git alias I've created. And uh, errors right here, it's right in front of me and I'm missing it, but I'm part of the issue is I'm, I'm seeing this flood of logs and I'm not the, the issue isn't becoming obvious to me. And so let's see. Um, come back to draft go. So let's slow this down. Um, so I run go test and you see one of the, the logs view is this uh, go sitemap generator. And there's like a few things that are kind of noisy about this. So it's saying like 2.0.1 incompatible STM. So like I've seen that before and I've always just kind of ignored it. It says max processors one. Um, so it's, it's producing a lot of those logger messages. And I, I'm not sure why, but it's cluttering up the, the logs and it's making it hard for me to see what's actually going wrong. So I scroll up, scroll up, and I'm still not seeing like all the things. And I actually scrolled so fast that I missed the actual issue. So let me see if I can slow this down. So here we go. Let's see if I can catch it. And here we go. Oh. Yeah, there we go. So this is the actual failure. This is what starts all of the log output. Response is not valid JSON. Markdown drove to the zoo. Markdown drove to the zoo. So I don't know if I would figure it out from this error message, but it's um, it's showing me that there's it's printing JSON twice. Um, and that's because I've forgotten to remove the old encoder. But that would have been a lot better of a hint than just seeing like all these all this log spew and, and not really seeing what the actual uh, go test assertion failure is. Um, and then how long does it take me to actually figure out what the problem is? Um, okay, so here's me like saying, okay, if I just do it the old way, um, which I can't because that's where I declare the variable. So if I just comment at respond, okay, does that work? And it does, so I realize, okay, I'm screwing something up here. And then I try commenting out the other part, not realizing that that's the thing that's actually causing the problem because I'm responding twice. And then I think finally it dawns on me, oh, I shouldn't be responding twice. There we go. And and then I, I'm pretty confident that I found the error, so I don't even try uh, retesting. And I inline the anonymous struct. So. I don't know what I'm wasting my time with now. OK, here we go. And now I go test. And now it works. Cool. So I figured out the, the error. But just to pause here, there are a few things going on. There's the, the logs view from the sitemap uh, generator. And then I think it's maybe just like a, a thing I need to keep in mind when I, I do see test failures that there's going to be a log spew um, for all the, the standard out uh, errors from the, the Go standard logging. But the error is actually going to be the first thing, the, the first of those logs. So uh, continuing on, let's see what else happens. And I think at this point, I'm like, OK, I have a pretty good feel for doing this. So now I'm going to try another one, respond OK, and go test. That one worked. That was really straightforward. That was easy. Um, and then the, the thing I'm noticing here is that respond OK, it never actually touches the HTTP request parameter. Um, maybe this is a thing that I I was in the original code from Matt Ryer. Maybe Matt Ryer has other reasons for doing that. Maybe it's just to, to keep the standard look of like response writer, 
HTTP request. But for now, I'm just going to take it out because it's it's just more typing, and uh, I can add it back in the future if I need it. So this is just a little bit of refactoring where I'm I'm pulling out those request objects because uh, none of my code actually touches it. And so now I have to update the the calls to respond. Okay, go test um, that fails because I forgot to update one of them. And respond OK. OK, now it's working. Um, and so then instead of just, um, so what I had been doing was was from memory, like going to all the HTTP handlers that I knew encoded JSON. But I realized that I could just do a global search for json.newenc and find all the instances of the encoder. And this brings me to another bottleneck that I noticed is that uh, I, I do have to spend a lot of time jumping from uh, the the code editor to the search results, and so like it's anytime I have to to move from the mouse to the keyboard or from the keyboard to the mouse, it's a bit of a bottleneck, and I'm looking for ways that I can eliminate those. Um, but I'm I'm placing that, and so yeah, you see like I have to just keep going from the main editor to the the global search panel over on the side, and that's a bit of a bottleneck. And so I wanted to look up if there's a better way to do that. Um, one thing I'm noticing reading or watching the video is that I have this kind of inconsistent method for replacing. Like this is this refactoring is kind of tough because it's it's very repetitive. Like all of my calls to json.newencoder look similar, but they're not identical. In some cases, I'm declaring a response inline. In some cases, I um, am getting the the data from calling another function. So, and it's like maybe fourteen. 10 to 15 instances. So it's not the kind of thing where it's like, if it were like 50, I'd think more about automation. Like how, what can I write that is going to replace all these in, in one fell swoop? Um, or maybe it's like reusable for nine or, or 10 or 10 to 15 instances. It's sort of hard to justify like investing in, in some kind of like more complicated uh, refactoring tool. But, and, and I'm also not familiar with like something that I never use tools like that. So if you have suggestions, let me know. But this is me uh, continuing to just go through and re replace these, respond OK. Um, so let's speed through this. Um, I'm stopping here to see if I can replace page view response with an anonymous struct. Um, but I realize I can't because it's used in the test code as well. But maybe that's something I can come back to in the future. So this is me continuing to um, do these replacements. Um, and as I go, I'm getting faster and faster, uh, not only because I, I'm playing this on speed up, but it's it's a smoother process. I'm uh, getting more comfortable with this, this repeated muscle memory I'm building a little bit. Um, and so I go through all of them. And again, we're seeing that like there's kind of a, a slowdown in going from the mouse to the, the keyboard to the mouse. But I'm almost all done. Here's a big one. OK. And then this is the last one I actually have to replace. And so what I'm doing here is um, I ran the, the go tests. And then I'm just, as like a smoke test, I'm playing with the, the server end to end. And so I like posted an update to what got done. Um, I'm updating my profile because I remember doing that. And then here's another issue. This is um, sort of a bug I ran into. So I updated my profile. I put in what I thought was in, was correct data, and it's telling me invalid profile update request. So I'm not sure if this is uh, a result of me messing up the refactoring. I think it's pretty unlikely because this is this is a refactoring where like the compiler is doing a lot of heavy lifting and checking. So it's difficult for me to mess something up here, but it, it's given me a little bit of pause. And so um, I, it's pointing to uh, mail missing at or angle address. And so I think that's a little bit strange. I, I pop over into burp and I look at what the actual request looked like and I see the email address. It does have an at sign. Like I, I thought maybe like something is getting between the front end and the back end, something is getting dropped. But the the request looks like what I expect and the back end is responding with a 400 bad request, which is also what I expect. Uh, or actually, I mean, it's what I would expect for a bad request, but I don't know what is wrong with this request because it looks right to me. Um, and so, here I have to do a little bit of debugging and, and try to figure out what's actually going wrong. Um, but in the meantime, I'm pretty confident that it's not the refactoring. I, I'm suspicious that it's a different issue. 
And so I'm going to commit these changes now um, and then investigate a little bit while the the end-to-end -end tests are running because the end-to-end -end tests for what got done are in like a five to eight minute process. So I've got some time. So you see me do the commit um, and then I push it up to GitHub. This is another instance where like I actually have to go to GitHub to create the pull requests. And I'm wondering if this is something I should um, do in the CLI as well. I, I don't know that it's worth it because I do like doing a final review in the, the GitHub interface. So I can just make sure, um, just do like a final pass for myself, make sure I'm not committing anything I didn't mean to and that the, the code changes all look right in a different interface. Um, so that you see me doing that here. And so this, the CI is running. And so now I switched to a new branch to investigate this, uh, this email address thing. So you see, I get it again, like I got the same thing. So I'm again, confident that it's not related to the refactoring because I'm seeing it on a clean branch. And so here I'm putting in some, uh, some logging output to see what the, the actual issue is. So printing out the email address, um, then printing it out after it's been parsed. And I'm going to try the request again. Um, and I see it's still getting the same thing. So it's getting the email address. It's getting testexample.com on the, the server. So that's surprising. And I, I start to think like maybe it's one of the other fields. It's also taking a Twitter handle and a Mastodon address. Um, if, if you're clever in the audience, you'll figure out what the issue is already. But the, the actual issue, ooh, I was going a little too fast, is I had forgotten that Mastodon addresses are look like email addresses because um, Mastodon is decentralized. So you have to specify what your username is and then the domain that you're on. So it, it looks like an email address. And so if I change it to uh, the Joe Masto at some instance.com, then it works. And so this is a separate issue. I'm realizing that like the, the uh, user response I, I see, like the, the feedback that the user gets when they forget to put in an at um, should be a little bit more clear. This is a mistake that I've been making for a while. Um, I, for a lot of my development, I would err on the side of not giving the user a lot of information about the error uh, for the sake of security, for like not exposing implementation details. There's a, there's a time to do that. I think it's when it comes to things like exposing stack traces, you don't want to share too much with the, the end user. But just for, for like saying what the error message is, I think that's pretty safe and it, it helps me debug and figure out like what's actually going wrong without giving this like very opaque error that sends me to the server logs. So um, I, I go back to the, the implementation of the Mastodon address parser and I change the error response instead of just, so because it looks like an email address, I can just use the, the Golang standard uh, email address parser but I was just passing back the exact error I got from the mail parser, which is confusing because um, it doesn't say anything about Mastodon. It just says uh, like the, the email address is incorrect. So I decided to add my own uh, custom error messages for this. So invalid Mastodon address and then add the error. Um, as I try this, I realized that that actually doesn't make any sense. Like it, it generates this weird, um, let me see if I get this. I oh, know I haven't. Uh, propagated that to the front end, but it, it generates like kind of a confusing error message, invalid profile update request, invalid Mastodon address, mail missing. So it's like, if I saw that in two weeks, I'd probably forget again, like what is going on here. Um, and so I, I get second thoughts about this, uh, this error message. And then also I need to, yeah, um, propagate the error message in the actual response to the user. Cause I was just giving like a very opaque response. Uh, out of concern for not exposing any implementation details. So I tried again. Now I'm actually getting the full error message back on the front end. Um, but yeah, like I'm seeing, okay, this is really confusing. I don't really want to show the user this. This is not going to make any sense to the user. Um, and so I come back to this, uh, this error and I say, okay, like maybe you don't have to actually pass back the, the error message from the mail parser. So I make this change here where I, I get rid of the error and I say, okay, invalid message address. Yeah, that's probably a little bit better. And then I realize I can actually improve on this as well. Must be in the form of handle at domain. Um, and then I change it to handle at host name. Yeah, I was, I was debating with like host name instance. So now if you submit a request like this, you get a lot more information that becomes 
clear what the issue is. And we're coming up on the end. Uh, okay, so I'm just committing a new uh, fix here for, for this issue. And then in the meantime, these tests have passed, so I, I merge those commits. And I start a new PR. So the other thing I realized thinking about this one a little bit later is I probably should have started more from the front end. Um, and so coming back to here, uh, one of the problems here is, can, I don't know if I can find before I actually started making edits. Um, part of the issue is like this, I don't think I can actually get to it. Can I find it? Part of the issue is that uh, all the other fields in that, okay, here we go. So the email address field has a placeholder that shows you like what the, it's a little, a little reminder that shows you what format an email address is supposed to look like. The Mastodon address doesn't. And so like, I think if I had that reminder there, I would uh, remember that that's what it's supposed to look like. And then I think we can also, it's it's easier if we uh, do the, the format checking. Like we should ultimately do the format checking on the back end to make sure that we're getting a well-formed uh, input from the user. But the we can do it more effectively on the, the front end because the front end still know, like can see as soon as you type that in, hey, that's not a well-formed Mastodon address. And same thing with, with all of these. And so I, I think the better fix might be to invest more in the, the front end error checking. Okay, so coming back. So the first issue was it took me a really long time to get started up. Um, see, we're, let's see, we're at, what was it? A minute and a half minute and a half just to, to get the server running and I'm copy pasting a bunch of different commands. Um, and so I'm gonna show you what I did to fix that. So uh, I decided to add, let's see. Um, so the readme had a bunch of like separate commands that I had to copy paste. And I realized it makes a lot more sense if I just make one script that I can run. And so I'm gonna try that. And that's one of these, it's so, simple that I don't need to copy paste it. I can just remember dev script serve because um, that's similar to a pattern I use on a lot of my projects. And so here we go. And so I've got this, this dev server already running. Um, that was much faster than what it, what it took before. Um, and so then the other issue was forgetting the syntax for anonymous structs. I don't know how much I can do in terms of like changing my habits to remember that. I think it's just a matter of remembering, uh, just being in practice of, of writing Go code a little bit more. Um, the other issue was that the um, there was a lot of spew in the, the Go tests. And so um, to investigate that, I looked at the sitemap. And oh, actually, I should show you what it looked like before. So I'm going to pop back a little bit. Oh, no. You're, you're seeing, if you're reading my output, you're seeing the the answer. So um, the the log about the, the sitemap, um, it was like this confusing log message that was coming from here. And so it was saying like number of processors. And I did check out, um, I looked at, let's see. I looked at, I looked at the, the source code for this and I'm like, is there a way to get rid of all that um, log output, and it said to disable all non-essential output, you can do set for both to false. And I did that, and then it would just still uh, produce the logs view about. I guess the sitemap generator really thinks it's important to announce how many processors it's using, so I, I couldn't turn that off. Um, and so the, the other issue was that it would, was saying like incompatible version, and that's something I've run into the past, and I just kind of ignored because I didn't feel like investigating it. But they said like. Uh, as of version 2.0, this repo is available as a Go module. Um, so you're supposed to add this, do Go build, and then the old way was to uh, pull in the package like that. Um, but I was still ending up with, let's see if I can pull this up. I was still ending up with, uh, like when I would do it, it would say like v2.0.1 incompatible. Um, I don't know if this is such a, oh, I'm not showing VS code. Uh, it would it would show this this uh, v two point one incompatible. I don't know that this is a super interesting error. Um, 
But I, I figured out the issue was just I had to, I removed this line and then I copy pasted um, the exact, oh, I deleted myself. Uh, I put in the exact uh, import that they were using, this v2, because I realized that my import was leaving that out. If I pull back to sitemap, uh, my import was leaving that out, so I needed to put in v2. Um, and then I did uh, go tidy again, and that fixed it. Um, so that, but that actually wasn't producing log output. That was that was getting rid of the kind of red herring of saying I had uh, an incompatible version, but it that wasn't the the cause of the uh, the huge amount of log spew. So looking at the code a little bit, so um, sitemap get, um, I that's the the handler that gets called when. Um, we get any request for sitemap.xml, so it generates the sitemap for what got done. And so we start by, uh, this is a, a common pattern for HTTP handlers. So we, we do the one-time initialization here, and then we return a function that uh, handles the HTTP request, so response writer request. Um, and this is actually fine for production code, And the thing that I, but the thing that I was overlooking was that when I run tests, because um, because it it like does routes.go and it always calls this sitemap.get, it's always generating this. It's always generating the set. Oops, go back to the sitemap. It's it's doing this process of building the sitemap every time, um, and that doesn't really need to happen until we get the first request. And so we don't really want to just like the naive solution is just put it here which we probably could do. We don't get it too many requests for building the sitemap, but then it means that we have to redundantly build the sitemap every time um, we get a request. And actually, that, now that I think about it, this, the sitemap can change uh, as, the, as the content on the site changes. So maybe I should have just done this. But what I ended up doing was, oh. let's pop back to the main. So I changed it to a uh, lazy loader. So now it, lazy loads on the first request. And that means that if I do um, now, I can test this, and I'm going to get an error. But you'll notice I don't get a lot of these uh, sitemap log output. It's just log output from stuff that I've written. And it's a little bit dirty still, but I can I know that if I can just scroll up to the top, I get to the actual thing that's going wrong. I'm going to stash those. Um, and then the issue of um, popping back and forth between the, the search. So um, let's say uh, hp.status. Uh, yeah, so um, I didn't know a way to get from the, the search menu into the actual search results from the keyboard. And I looked it up, and it's F4. And so I can do that. Uh, F4 goes to the next result. Shift F4 goes to the previous result. Uh, I believe I can also do Control Shift F and then Control Down. That's another way to get there. But yeah, so I can do that. Um, F4 is way up there on the keyboard. I don't know if that's a great keyboard shortcut. Uh, depending on how often I do this, I might want to rebind that to um, a more convenient key that's, that's near to the home row, or at least not way up there in the, the function keys. Um, so that's all. So um, if you noticed anything that you think I, I should optimize further, let me know. Um, and let me know if this is helpful. So uh, I'll see you next time.